Uh, this is the part where I say, here's German on lead, but no, I, I'll t tell a little bit more. He told a really funny story yesterday when he arrived that I've been following German for, for some time on, uh, on, uh, on the Instagram. Like, I just love the shapes and the designs and colors and everything. And I just recently decided like, I will invite him for the next uh, theme park because I, I love to share things I like with you. It's not for you to decide, for me mostly. What? That one works. Oh, ah, uh -huh. uh, so I was, uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, and uh, when German uh, arrived to Finland, he said that just a few days after I contact contacted him uh, about the theme park, he was contacted by our, like, I mean, Rovio's uh, Canada office, so he could work with them, which was a bit weird and a and, uh, really strange coincidence, but I guess just like, you know, really cool artists are, like ideas are in the air and, and uh, I think he is, uh, he's going to show you right now why me and the whole freaking Rovio thinks he's a cool. Yep, start. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Ivan, for such a, a great presentation. You are too kind. Oh, okay. This is a little bit scary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, yeah, for the whole, um, for the people helping to the to the event. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Anyway, I'm going to start with it because yeah, I'm going to be awkward just a few minutes until I get used to to speak here. But well. My name is Germán Rita Carmona, and I've been working on video games and animation, TV shows, uh, these last few years. Um, recently, I finished working on a video game called Oli Oli World, where I've been the only concept artist, uh, well, doing the visual development for, for the game. And I want to get to explain how I ended up proposing some designs, like these characters, for example, for the first DLC of Oli Oli World called Void Riders, or how I ended up proposing uh, something like this. Okay. <laughs> this is supposed to be a, this was supposed to be a suit that you could wear on the game. It didn't make it to the end, but anyway, I just wanted to, to be able to show it. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, <laughs> my goal with the presentation is to talk a little bit about my experience getting into this industry. Um, before getting to Oli Oli World, I want to show some of the projects that I've been able to, to work on. And also to give you a little bit more context, I'm from the Canary Islands, uh, specifically from Lanzarote, one of the small islands from there. Um, and yeah, I've been drawing my, my whole life, but I didn't discover that concept art was a thing until I was 19, 20 years old. At that moment in my life, I was, I was studying engineering and basically my brain was melting from trying to understand science or anything related to that. So yeah, anyway, I switched careers and I started to study fine arts. Um, as you know, fine arts is, has a more traditional approach to, to art and I was making stuff like this where basically I focus on oil painting, charcoal drawings, um, life drawing with, uh, with models. Um, and yeah, during this period of time, the, the only thing that I had clear about concept art was that you needed to get your fundamentals in order. So it was great to be able to have this, this experience, the studying this degree at university, because I was able to focus on these fundamentals. Um, anyway, uh, something that I tried to do was to um, keep learning on my, on my own time, doing sketches for fun and personal projects uh, on my own. Um, yeah, so these are some examples of oil paintings and charcoal drawings. But anyway, what the hell is concept art? Because at that time, I wasn't really sure what, what was that about. Yeah, I just knew slightly what it, it was. Um, I think that now with some time, uh, I think there are some different ways explaining what, what's concept art. Um, and that there is not just one path getting into this kind of job. Um, 
And also, besides from painting and, and drawing, that's something that you always have to have in mind is to propose ideas and have a unique view on things. So anyway, all of this time, when, when, I, was, when I was at the university, uh, I was focusing on just making stuff uh, render, um, basically painting things, because I thought that in order to get a job in concept art, you, have, you needed to know how to render and render stuff. Like that, that was it. There was no other way around. So basically, I was trying to get rid of all the lines in the designs that we were making. Like these are some examples uh, uh, when I was studying fine art, where I basically was focusing on designing characters, and then I was trying to paint them uh, as well as possible. Um, <laughs> Also, I was trying to, to learn 3D photobashing and all of these things more used in concept art. So at the end of the, when I was finishing the degree, I was trying to, I was trying to produce some images like these ones, for example. These are two shots that I made basically with a, it not, without drawing involved, was uh, just for the initial thumbnails, was basically 3D block out and then using, uh, photos and textures to produce the final shot. Like the character here, for example, was my flatmate at that time in, at university. So it, yeah, you have to use your resources. Um, yeah, anyway, I didn't enjoy it very much making this kind of thing, but still, like I was trying to learn what was concept art, so I was trying to do everything, basically, and trying to touch uh, every subject that uh, I found. So now I want to go in. I want to go in a very different direction and to talk about a very special project. Um, and it's uh, a short film called Las Niñas Terribles, uh, Terrible Girls in, in English. Um, so at university, I met some amazing artists and I was able to, uh, to work with them on this short film. Basically, the team was uh, David Orellana, the animator and director of the short film, Alba Ballesta, character designer, um, prop designer, uh, Rocio Batanero, uh, BFX and um, post-production, who, by the way, is here today with me, and an amazing designer, too. Um, myself making the environment designs, um, all of the backgrounds for the, for the short film. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. So you have, like, I'm not going to focus too much on the short film, but uh, anyway, the story is about some kids building a monolith uh, in the middle of nowhere, let's say. Um, and there is a supervisor watching the construction of the monolith and also counting the, the bricks. Um, also, the short film uh, shows a conflict between this, uh, this group of kids. Um, Here's also the trailer that you won't get. Like I wanted to explain the story briefly before because from the trailer you won't get uh, what what's about. Like you will, you will get just some uh, some view on how how it looks. Okay, let's see. If, all right. <laughs> going on here. So 
sorry, technical issues here. Uh, okay, ready to go. Yeah, so I wanted to share a little bit of the process here about this project because at the end, the short film is 11 minutes long. Um, it was a very small team developing the, the short film, so it was basically a lot of work. And speaking about the speaking about the environment and the the production of backgrounds, the the whole short film happens in just one location. So we we were able to take advantage of that and in order to not go crazy with the with the amount of work that I had to do painting the backgrounds, I decided to start using some three D. Like here is a beautiful three D blockout. Um sorry to the three D artists here. Um, so well, I made the I made this 3D 3D blockout after having some of the uh, well the, the concept for the different areas in this short film. This is just an example of the of the of the sketches for for this um, this shed where the where the supervisor of the construction is watching the kids building it. Um, um, yeah, so we made the concept for the overall view of the of the environment and the different areas in it, and then and then I made the, this this piece of art. So so the, the advantage of doing this, well, obviously, was to to save time uh, with the with the layout. But that was the main reason to to use three D basically, because uh, in the end we were able to to produce the the initial part of the backgrounds like real quick like this image is a like a, a, well it's a bare view of the 3d blockout and well in theory that red squares are like some examples of how of the cameras in, inside the 3 software and how those shots could look uh, in the final in the final background paintings um, so basically the advantage of using this uh, the 3d was to uh, sit down with David, the animator and director, and to extract all of the layouts from the 3D using directly the, the storyboard. So we were able to just use the cameras to find uh, uh, the closest um, composition to the shots that he wanted to, to have, and also to improve some of the compositions and so on. Um, then to speed up the process, because I didn't have to worry about uh, perspective or um, yeah, like the composition on the 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 base for it. So in this image on the left, you have one example of the pages from the storyboard, and then the process from the layout to the background painting to the final image with the with the animation and the VFX over it. Um, uh, yeah, so sitting down to to get the layouts was just a matter of. Uh, a couple of hours, uh, that was it. And the great thing about this what, is that we were able to work simultaneously on different shots. And on the same shot, it is really the matter because he was able to animate over the 3D layout. And at the same time, I was able to paint over it. So then it was a matter of just coordinating to, to put them together, which, by the way, like the whole, the whole short film was animated by one guy. So that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. this. These are some examples of backgrounds from the from the short film, and I had to paint like around 80 backgrounds, so it was quite a long time. And at this moment, we had already the 3D layout to to help with the composition of the perspective. And I was still thinking like, okay, what else could I do to save work? Because at the end, like something, when you're doing a repetitive task, I'm constantly thinking about okay, how to how to save time because it's going to be kind of boring doing uh, re repeating the same stuff over and over, uh, over and over so i started to create these sets of uh, of images to to help me with the re with this repetition like the top left image is a set of uh, blending modes and textures for photoshop that i had to re use consistently through the different backgrounds um, the bottom images are just some examples of key backgrounds that I was using to color pick from them. Because, uh, yeah, because at the end, the, the, um, the environment of the short film is divided into four areas. So I just needed 
one key background pair area to have uh, to have that as a reference for the colors. And then the image on the right uh, is a set of mountains that I basically was using the same, almost the same mountains for all of the shots. But since they are far away, that uh, you you won't notice. Um, yeah, so the the short film is just it has just three color palettes. So this kind of thing ended up being super handy. Um, this is the color palette referring to the first half of the of the short film. Uh, this is the this is our color palette for the second half, and then this is the part this is the epilogue of the of the short. So you get uh, an overview of the how the color works on each part of it. Uh, now, even though it's very simple, I wanted to show a little bit of the process uh, doing the doing the backgrounds. It's pretty straightforward, and there is no mystery here because basically, top left image is a three blockout, top right image line art that they do over it, adding some more detail and props. Uh, bottom left image, I add the colors, textures if needed, and uh, bottom right image, it's the final the final background painting with glow and some other different effects. And the only technical thing that I would mention is that the the shadows of the backgrounds are extracted directly from the 3D. And I know that for the 3D pros, this is not a great achievement, but for me it was at that time because it basically was extracting the the, the shadows from the from the render. Like like the, the image from the left is the is a shadow directly from it. So it was just a matter of fixing the edges to, to match the, the line art that I was producing. And this saved me a lot of time and kept consistency throughout the short film in the whole in all of the backgrounds. Um, yeah so the the process I have shown this is the this is the shot. I, I kept the shot from before and after but so you can see a little bit more about the short film but anyway this is this is very short, it's just a couple of seconds. Yeah, so, okay. same, same problem as before, let's how do I get... Um, Anyway, yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's that was what I wanted to. Sh oh. What's this? Should I do turn on of fly access? It's okay. No thanks. Any suggestion <laughs> no for this? What? No thanks. No, thanks. no thanks. Okay. No thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we we got to the end of this project if I'm able to move forward. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, unfortunately it's not available online yet, but I wanted to show you a little bit of the ha how the process was for this project. And anyway, I have what's going on now. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I wanted to show you a little bit about it. And still on my air station, I have uh, a lot of the work that, that I did for it. And like soon, I guess I will upload almost everything. Well, everything from the, from this project. Um, so this this short film, uh, the production of the short film, was around two years. It started when I was still at university, and it ended up when I was already working as a freelance. So I want to move back a little bit to talk about when about that time when I was finishing finishing my studies of fine art, because. Uh, I remember that the time was uh, was tricky because I was looking for any job related to video games or animation. Like I really didn't care. I was just looking for for something uh, in in the industry, let's say, and checking every job listing on the internet and sending lots of emails. Um, and finally, finally, I got uh, my first opportunity from a big studio, big animation studio in Manchester, but um, they offered a lower salary than what I thought was fair, and I turned it down. And this was a, this was a crazy move from my part, and it felt quite stupid for some time, 
because at that moment I needed a job. But anyway, a couple of months later, I received an email from the same company um, for the, and they offered the same position in a different project with a better salary. Um, I think that it's necessary to know the value of your work, even though I, I don't recommend doing this uh, at all. Um, more if you need the job and you're starting. Like, so this is no advice, this is just what I did at my experience. Uh, and, but anyway, I think, I think I got lucky. It was a uh, right timing, but still, like that's something that needs some um, some thought. Um, anyway, uh, it was a it, this was a job in animation. Um, before of that, I made some some animations for fun, like this one, for example. Okay, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, no, I, I I didn't hire because of this. Like the uh, this was just an excuse to show you this animation and to rescue it. Uh, anyway, uh, oh shit. Okay, so no, the the job this job was making two day layouts for a Nickelodeon show. Um, it was a great opportunity. Uh, it wasn't super creative because of the work that to the layout works for this kind of Nickelodeon show. But anyway, uh, it was a fantastic opportunity having no experience in a studio. Um, still, like around this time, I was just looking for an excuse to be in a studio. I didn't care if it wasn't concept art at all. Um, and so at that time, I was, doing, I was doing fine at this Nickelodeon show, but uh, but at this point, something happened in my family, and I decided to, to leave my job to, to get back to Lanzarote and to spend some time with my parents. So, so I decided to, to use this time to, to become a freelance artist, basically, uh, and well, uh, try, trying to at least. So I was searching for any project online, and I was sending, again, hundreds of emails. And um, because I had more time, I started to, to work again on my portfolio. And for once, I decided that the best use of my time was to, to do something that excited me. So I started to focus on basically just drawing. I did some different freelance works, which didn't give me much money, but made me feel like I was moving forward. This is an example from, from a small project of the type of freelance uh, jobs that I was trying to, to, was trying to do. And then I made uh, this series of illustrations, kind of a short story called Meaningless Adventure. Um, I thought that this was silly at that moment, but it made me visible on our station and Behance, basically. So I started to receive inquiries for real projects. Um, and then after this, like this is when I considered that I really started to work as a concept artist because my, my first job was working with Quest Studio from LA, which, uh, which was a crazy jam for me because we worked together on, on Valorant. Um, so still, I was thinking that in order to, in order to work as a concept artist, you needed to, to know how to render stuff. Like again, just you need to know how to present stuff as polished as possible. And um, for 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 a moment, and well, initially it seemed like I was right because I have to paint props like this, for example, when it's uh, heavy focused on <laughs> on rendering. Um, and then, well, uh, also this prop too. Like I think it's something that you carry on your weapon on Valorant. Um, but anyway, the scary time for me came when I got asked to to paint this. Uh, an environment concept for this for one of the, uh, it's a part of one of the levels. Um, basically, it's a overpainting of a 3D blockout. Um, something that I wasn't used to do because I've been always relying a lot on line art. So it was was quite a challenge to to paint, to just paint and render something and show materials. but. Oh boy, because I knew nothing. Um, still, my next step was making some player card illustrations for for this game too. And these are yeah, three examples of that kind of illustration. And yeah, the tricky part is that these are 
final assets for the game, so they have to be way more, well, they have to be more polished than, uh, than a concept. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great opportunity, like don't get me wrong, I just complaining about the painting because it's so, something that still scares me and I'm so used to just use line art that is, that any time that I have to do something like this is a real, is a very challenge. Um, and yeah, anyway, after West, other studios followed to help on other projects, which most things are under NDA, sadly. But anyway, so I can move to the to the main part of the presentation, which is uh, Oli Oli World. Um, um, I remember that at this time, Road7 uh, approached me to, to work on this IP. Um, one of the first things that I had on, on Road7 was a chat with Paul Abbott, the art director of the game. Um, he mentioned that they wanted the game to, to look the way I draw, using the examples of Meaningless, Meaningless Adventure, the, the project that I showed you before, which I thought was quite silly to, to do and to show on our station, but he used it as an example of something that they wanted for the game. And also for me to just add like strange ideas to it. So yeah, anyway, what can you say to, to something like that? Um, anyway, I'm going to show you a gameplay trailer, just in case you don't know about this game, you haven't played it, or you didn't even know that it exists. Somewhere far across the Ali Ali world is Radlandia. A nation where the beaches, trees, and rocks you ride across were forged by the skate gods themselves. Of course they're real. Almost everyone agrees. Some say they even created the third dimension so that we could have more opportunities to explore as we seek Narvana. In fact, Shifon, the skate wizard, actually talks to the gods, and she's traveling the land with her crew to train her successor, you. So as you go from beautiful Sunshine Valley, through the forests, across the desert, and into picturesque sketch site, uh, Suze, just roll that back a sec. Whoa, <laughs> hello. Ghost trees, zombies, all these aliens? There's some weird stuff in Radlandia. Just ask Mike. The only thing that hypes him more than a good mystery is a gnarly trick. whoop -a! And as anyone who's been skating for a while will tell you, if you want a wall ride, grind, or slide across moving obstacles, you'll inevitably hit a bunch of stuff or bounce off some things you were supposed to smash through. But that's okay. Just get Ship on to teleport you back with her skate wizard powers and go again. That's the spirit. Make Dad proud. Dad! This caring father figure will help you skate in style. Whether you dress like that or this, riding on that, with that haircut, or wearing those. While traveling across Radlandia and meeting its people may be reward enough, what will you find if you do reach Narvana? They say it's where champions compete to find the perfect flow, challenging each other's skills and ascending the ranks to be crowned the gnarliest and win rewards. You'll also be able to summon forth new tracks to ride that you can save and share using a postcode, regardless of what platform you're on. A near endless array of jumpy, grindy madness. So don't delay. Come shred by the sea. Chase a bee. Meet a tree. Take a trip to Radlandia and achieve Narvana. Oh, bonus items. Okay, enough with advertisement. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm trapped here again. <laughs> yeah, sorry, there will be a couple of moments again where I am trapped in the presentation. Um, Okay, so you have already met the crew that will travel 
with you through Radlandia. And, and Radlandia is a weird world divided by five biomes. And these biomes were created by the, by the skate gods. Um, yeah, I know that all of this makes a lot of sense, but anyway, instead of me just destroying the, the story, I'm going to, I, I'm going to show you the, the, the game animatic intro that pretty well explained the, some other things about the, this world. Uh, well, yeah, before that, this is a map of Radlandia. So you see how it's structured and the different biomes that, uh, that are there. Um, yeah, so here's the here's the first thing that you watch when you start playing the game. This is Radlandia, the ultimate skate utopia. An island where even the trees are skatable. Legend has it that Radlandia was created by five immortal skate gods. These celestial skatriarchs carved the mountains, grinded the deserts, and kick-flipped the beaches forming five mighty districts, one area each to represent their own versions of skate paradise. When the skate god's work was done, they pulled the biggest airs and ascended to Narvana. Here they waited for a skater who could master each of their five skills with a steez that is true and a style that is both sick and gnar. Eventually, a skater was appointed as their representative in Radlandia. A skate wizard. A master of the four-wheeled stunt wood. The job of a skate wizard is paramount to Radlandia. They must maintain balance between Narvana above and the spirit of skateboarding in Radlandia itself. But skate wizards are a rare thing. Maybe once in a generation? The current skate wizard, Chiffon, now approaching retirement, is on a search to find her replacement. Someone who can achieve true mastery, impress the gods, and keep Radlandia balanced like a skater on a board. And so, with the help of her crew, Mike, Suze, and a man that everyone just calls Dad, Chiffon is running tryouts for the next skate wizard. Could you be the one? Oh no, I'm <laughs> again. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, now I'm going to start to talk a little bit about the, the, the character exploration for, for this game, because uh, the beginning of the project, I was working on a lot of different elements. I basically have done the whole visual development, so there was a lot of things to work on. Um, and at that time, we didn't have an Arabic designer, so the world wasn't built it itself wasn't built. Um, so I remember that I started to make like pages of props, some more generic environments, and and the human characters. And so let's start here because it's the this page is the first thing that I made for for the game, and I think that the the concept will change uh, a bit uh, through through time. Um, so yeah, basically to start designing this world, we started uh, for the it, we started to think about the main character, uh, which was going to be human. So th this was a way of setting how the humans could look like in this world. Um, Again, the process was very straightforward. I started to, I, I proposed these first sketches, then we iterated on them, and we got to this page, which are almost final. Um, it was a matter of just finding the right proportions and facial features of these characters, basically. And what we wanted the style to look like. Um, this uh, turnaround of these characters, uh, Almost naked to see to see the some proportions. Then we made then we made some more explorations on how to how to change the body and how much could it change in the customization items menu because that's something quite strong in this game. The customization items where you are able to you are able to change your character quite a lot. Um, then this is the this is the like the first 
approved design f made for, for the game. But anyway, of course, in this game, like to make this crazy world, there are not just humans. We have like a lot of crazy, crazy characters. But oh yeah, I, sorry, I forgot about that. Before going to the other NPCs, like uh, we use these uh, these human designs to to make some some other different characters. Like uh, the, for example, the not just the main character, but the some background NPCs that you will find through this world. And uh, as you can see in these images, they are all around you populating this world. Um, and also we use these designs as a base for the local crews. The local crews are basically skateboarding crews that you will encounter in these different biomes. Um, here are three examples uh, from left to right. The Poison Boys from Skate Side, the Meltas crew from Sunshine Valley, and the Trifecta crew from Los Bulgas. So with these characters, we were able to uh, change them uh, a, a, li a little bit, adding some special props and stuff like that. But all of them had a, has the base of the of the human designs that we made at the beginning. And anyway, now talking about the other kind of NPCs, like this is probably yeah, this is probably my my favorite part because I basically was able to go wild here and still like. Uh, Keeping the keeping the level of detail because of how 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 the game is, um, but but uh, well yeah just before before I continue the the page on the left these are characters for Barrock which is the desert biome of the game and the page from the right is a page for Cloverbrook the the forest biome um, basically the the way of working. Uh, about these characters was to to think about the context of the biome because that has to focus on how these characters could live in that area. Um, and I, the the way I was trying to think about this was like okay, if I'm for example the Van Rock one thinking about the desert, the, okay, if there is a tree on a desert, the tree will be dead. So let's add cost trees. I don't know. So that was like the the kind of way that I was trying to think about these characters and still keeping them keeping them simple because we uh, we were not uh, allowed to have a lot of details on these background background characters. Um, and th so the way I worked on this was making just ton of them. So the team was able to choose from from these pages and just add uh, a few of them to to the levels. Um, Basically, also another thing to start working on these pages. Um, well, everything basically from from the game is that I had a um, an overall writing, uh, well, like a text from from amazing Liz Looney, the narrative designer of the game, who basically wrote the she wrote the the whole the whole world of Hollywood World. Um, and so, so yeah. So depending on what I was working on, she had like a more detailed description or not. Um, for example, for this local cruise, she wrote like a more uh, specific text for them, not just uh, how how they would look, but more in depth, to talking about uh, their attitude, their background, how they relate with other characters in the world, um, stuff like that. Like going more in depth with the with how these characters are. Um, and also about possible props that it could be wearing and adding a mood board with reference images to to add uh, an early visualization on how, how they, all the different things that they could be wearing or the props that they would be carrying or how they skateboarding could be like, like this one, for example, Aurora. Uh, she had like a popsicle skateboarding but yeah there are there are a lot of weird and different skates in this game um, and so the way of working with uh, with Liz was a constant loop of ideas where basically I used her writing to get inspired and to have uh, some direction and then sometimes I added some drawings that inspired her to do something else and that was the case of BB Hopper, this one of the side quest characters that you meet in Radlandia. And I still remember that I drew this guy during a break, and I call him Business Frog. That's the original sketch they made. And 
I wasn't even going to, to send it to them. But I was like, oh, let's see, I don't know. And I remember that at that time, I sent the, the page from Cloverbrook that I showed you before to the art director. And then I sent this one just in case. And uh, they instantly wanted to, to add him to the, to the game as, a, as one of the side quest NPCs that give you, give you some quests uh, through the game. And yeah, thanks to the final touch of Paul Abbott, it ended up looking better. Because now I think it, he looks like someone evading taxes. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm lucky him because he even starts his own trailer. Well, I can't promise that this is going to be the the I know. Uh, the last trailer that I show. Like there is something else later, but let's see. I know what you're thinking. Who is that gorgeous amphibian? And how can I be as successful as him? Well, I'll tell you, kiddo. You gotta come to Radlandia. Okay, just a little bit of a trailer. I'm not going to put another full one, but uh, yeah, I can't promise anything. So, um, yeah, so you met, the, you met the crew, but anyway, I want to talk a little bit about uh, two characters from the, from the crew and their development. Just a little bit about that. Um, here's the, well, on the left you see the final design, and on the right the first sketches that they made for him. Um, I just think that he's one of the funniest characters from the game. Um, so, I think that you can see that the the well the only thing missing are the bands on the on the knee pad like that's something that I sad to to have to be missing now but anyway um, so yeah I think that you can see that the, the essence of the character is not lost into translation to the final design but still like I think that the 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 final one is more solid and can coexist better with the with the rest of the crew but just a good way for you to to visualize it. And also also uh, that joke that we can we can miss this. Um, it's a gift so we're gonna let it run a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this to show a little bit of the magic from Liz Looney and yeah I, yeah, sorry because I think that this is one of the funniest jokes. But the game is full of of this, so it's amazing. Um, yeah, so the the other character I want to talk about a little bit is Shifom, the the skate wizard of the of the crew. Um, because I want to show the the change that this design uh, suffered during the production. Well, not suffered, but uh, she 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 got a quite a big well, she got some changes. Um, these were the first sketches that I proposed for this character and they were going in a very different direction because this character is supposed to have this kind of uh, magical uh, aesthetic uh, vibe um, so I was trying to think it like this way with these characters and this is the first version for Chiffon which uh, it's I think that the, the clothing and all of that is quite different, but uh, the, the the still like I think that the the change the change that she that she got was was great because sorry about the mic it's quite sensible to the to the distance but um, yeah so so yeah the, the the change that she got basically was to move along with the this skateboarding theme of the game basically because at the end the skate wizard is supposed to is one of the most important characters in Radlandia and we thought that this one was was looking okay for the game but still was not um, was hard to think about this as a skateboarder and it's not like everything in the game has to be fully uh, skateboarder related because it's at the end it's a crazy world. Um, it moves, it moves along skateboarding. But a character as important as the skate wizard should look when when you when you look at her, you should be able to see um, a skater and at the same time to feel that uh, magical vibe. And I think that that was a, this was a better translation of that of the idea of that character. And also it's. 
I think it's way better when you see Chiffon in game because of the animations and how how, how this character expresses. Um, so yeah, um, but anyway, like like I said, that this project is full of crazy stuff. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about the the environment design. But first, before finishing with the character design, I want to show you. I promise it's the last trailer of the game, <laughs> but it's. One of the, for me, it's one of the most exciting things that have happened thanks to, thanks to this production. And it's an amazing trailer made by Tubaint Studio. And they made this amazing kind of short. Thank you very much. Uh, how are we doing with the time? It's. We still have some. Some? <laughs> yes, some. Yeah. Um, it's okay. We don't finish. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, I'm try to speed up a little bit. Um, so, yeah, anyway, um, uh, th this is the first environment concept that I made for, for the game. And I still remember that at the beginning, obviously, I was still looking for the right tone and a more precise style for for the visuals. Um, so yeah, this is the first environment image that they made for it. Um, for this first piece, well, for the first environment pieces, I didn't have a lot of context because we still didn't have Liz Looney in the team. So anyway, I tried to add my own sense of humor, not just with the weird characters and the props, but adding like funny messages on the advertisement. Um, it was great because everyone on the team was really uh, looking forward to build like a welcoming, funny world. Um, so it was uh, it was really great to work on this on this kind of environments. Um, these are some examples of uh, environment concepts for city areas where we were looking about how, how the buildings could look like. Um, as you can see, like still the design wasn't there. Like there are too many details on these images, but still, these were pretty useful for the environment team to basically extract building from there. Um, and I remember that at that moment when I made it, when I made these images, there was just Alex Williamson, a 3D environment artist, working working on the game. So basically, he he was making the at the beginning he was making the the props. Um, and he was extracting them from these concepts. And we have some great iterations because since he didn't have the full information of the designs, he was making some blockouts based on what he was seeing on these concepts. And then I was making some over drawings. Like this, this is an example of, of that. Like we made a ton of these where I basically tried to add like some details. Even though like this game doesn't need uh, a lot of a lot of detail because of the way because the way it is, but still, it was nice to create more visual information for the environment and to, to create 
the more silliness to it, like this, just adding this add thing. I don't know. So these are just two examples of that kind of workflow that we had at the beginning. Um, and here is when I consider that the the style was at least the style of the concept that I was producing were consolidated. And uh, this is a environment concept, uh, kind of a key key illustration for for Cloverproc. Um, and still, like when I talk about style consolidation, it's just about my own work. I think that the translation into the game was the was the same. The only change were the tests about the about the level of detail in the in the levels. Um, and yeah, basically, in order to to work on an image like this, I usually I usually make like separated props like this, for example. These are other two pages for Cloverbrook when I tried to, because I tried to separate the issues. And here I was just thinking about the prop design and skatable props and different things that could be in the, in the levels. So I make this first to think a little bit more about the, the environment since there is nothing. I just need to, to start adding stuff. And then I made this kind of image where it's you get the the mood and the vibes of the of the place, and you get a, like a nice view on, on how the how the this area of the game could look like. But still, it's like this quite time consuming because you have to think about different problems. And since I was making all of the all of the visual development, I couldn't get really distracted with uh, making many of these. I have to focus on creating more visual information. And these are a couple of screenshots from this, from Cloverbrook. So you see a little bit of the translation where it's quite close, but obviously uh, leaving some detail detail behind. And yeah, also this, these are other two environment concepts for Narbana. And OK, Narbana is just like a weird place in Radlandia, where the skate gods are from, and in the game itself, like you can play there, and there are like some crazy levels reusing assets from the existing biomes. Um, so I made these two like full environments to to represent the craziness of these levels because it's like you reuse those assets, uh, and they are like uh, islands floating on the sky upside down on different ways. So, so these are two examples of this area too. And and I was mentioning before, like the the way that I that I made the environments was um, thinking about the first isolated props for for each biome and making like pages like this one, for example. These are just two examples for for Banrock, where I try to just create as much uh, as much as possible. And and yeah, and basically, so the environment thing had like more designs to choose from, or basically to get inspired. Um, because I think that the most, like the most important thing here is that to make sure that all of these designs can coexist together. Um, and yeah, and basically, well, I will come back to this. But yeah, basically, the general way that I. Uh, that I thought about this was like, um, yeah, just producing as much info as possible. Yeah, sorry, my brain just stopped there uh, <laughs> because of this slide. Because yeah, anyway, I, I'm gonna talk about about this one now. Um, yes, I think that was well shown on the trailer, but this game is side scrolling and you can move the camera, so the navigation through the game is quite limited, and at the same time you are moving super fast. So you can't have a lot of detail, a lot of detail here, uh, there. Um, and anyway, this is a this is a um, block out from the level designers of one of the levels, and the 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 part from below is just a, this is just a crop of the of the full of the full level, and you can see the craziness of the path. Um, and I didn't work much on how the builds are exactly built, but 
because well, this was a very time-consuming task to to set the rest of the level the levels this way drawing, but um, but from time to time I I try to to do some drawovers like this where by basically it's a very rough drawover of some parts of the level to to think about some elements that could be could be where and how to reuse some stuff, but anyway the management team was was in charge of this, and so yes and it was a very Basically, like a crazy, crazy, crazy task. Um, yeah, now, well, this is just this is an environment from Los Bulgas, uh, one of the biomes there. Um, and now, the, my my conclusions thinking about the about the environments and in comparison with the with the characters is that for the characters, I basically created like those big pages with uh, different. Different character designs where only the very best of them made their way into the game, whereas in environment I work in the in the same way, creating also big pages of props, but most of them were used were used in the game, or at least they they helped as a reference for the for environment team to create variations or to or to help build the, the atmosphere of the of the game. And now, before I end, I wanted to talk briefly about the first DLC of Oli Oli World, Void Riders. I, yeah, I, I was lucky enough to make also the key art for the advertisement, which is this image on the screen. It was like a massive illustration to to make. Um, yeah, quite time consuming too. Um, so yeah, the, just two things that I want to talk about first. The Boyd Riders crew. This is the crew that you will encounter on this DLC. The the weirdos that I show at the beginning. And yeah, I'm sorry to list the narrative designer because I'm going to destroy the pronunciation of the names of these characters. Because I think the first one is Kevin, then the second one is Sarah, and then is Tanji. And Tanji is the one that I want to talk about just a little bit. And I want to show you the first, like the sketches that I made for this character. And the weird thing is that this character was supposed to be, uh, well, these, these are aliens. Um, this one was supposed to have like a kind of an abstract head, but still being able to represent um, facial expression. So that was a little bit weird to, to do. Um, we were not able to change the body because of the because of how the animation works, but. Um, but anyway, we were able to go a little bit weirder with the with the head. And the process of the game was pretty straightforward. I made this page, and then we went for this body, and then this head, and that was it. And this is how this is how the these characters look in game. And obviously, for Tanji, when I made this head, we were like, oh yeah, we're going to add like a ton of animation to it. Like the eyes are going to be flexible. The pupils are going to be like a lava lamp. The these things are going to be moving and fading. And then Dicky, the tech artist, was like, what the hell, no. Uh, <laughs> just choose, you have to choose. Uh, we went for this and still, like I think that the, the translation from concept to 3D and final animation is just, is just quite amazing. And like Boy Riders is one of my favorite thing from, from this game. Um, the last thing, the cow wants it. Because I think that's yes one of the greatest greatest items from this game. Um, also, yeah, the fact that they wanted to show it it was for because of some of the technical problems that we have uh, developing this design. These were the first sketches. <laughs> these were the first sketches I made for it. Um, yeah, like I knew we were going to go for the third option, but. <laughs> Still, like I thought, okay, I'm going to try it anyway to go for some of the others, but no luck there anyway. Um, and here's a, here's a, yeah, this is not that funny because it's a technical feedback page from Arthur Thab, the lead character artist. Um, um, yeah, we're complaining about the, <laughs> the, the, the onesie. Because the because of the size of the design, there was there were a lot of clipping. Um, since you're skateboarding, you're making a lot of different poses and so on. So there were problems with the design clipping in a lot of parts of the of the character. Um, yeah, also the tail. Like we we were not able to have like a long tail. Um, but anyway, the solution was just making it closer to the body of the 
of the base of the base character. Um, these are some variations. Here is a turnaround of the onesie. Um, then it ended up like this. Like it's, I think it still looks quite strange because we changed the size of the body, but we kept the size of the head. And uh, yeah, I'm still like, happy that we were able to give that massive cow head with that skinny uh, cow ones. It just look weird. Um, and yeah, so we have come to to the end of the talk. Yeah, I just wanted to close with this weird cow onesie. Uh, it's been my dream with that. But yeah, and anyway, like I wanted to show what I think are like the most important things about about this game. Um, um, yeah, just what I think are the best concepts about this project because there were a, a lot of artworks for it. Um, yeah, and anyway, like for me personally, like this part of my career working on this type of project. Oh shit, I forgot about this. Okay, <laughs> like working on this project has been like a like a dream to me and a very important part of my life. Um, like. This type of game wouldn't be the same without the, a lot of creative minds involved in, in the team. Um, and yeah, and in, in, anyway, being able to work with uh, Liz Looney, the narrative designer, or Paul Abbott, the art director. Yeah, I mentioned that because they are like the closest people that I work with developing the, the whole game. Uh, also, the art director, like, he also has like a lot of crazy ideas and an open mind, which I think like is one of the most important things uh, in order to develop any project. And he was always trying to have my back in order to to propose new and weird ideas, which is something that I think was one of the most important things on this project. And now, anyway, now after finishing the, the this game, I left Roll Seven and I'm starting a very different path, um, working on some other exciting projects that I look forward to be able to show. And anyway, questions are more than welcome. If we have time, like, I, I don't know. Um, I will we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes? OK, well, we hurry, just two sentences. Uh, anyway, yeah, I will, I will be happy to, to try to help or chat after the talk is done. Um, anyway, also, if you want to, to send me a message through socials or anything, that's completely fine. And again, thank you, thank you, Ivan, for the invitation. And thank you so much for the theme park, theme park event, uh, for this opportunity. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I have to do a little disclaimer. Uh, theme Park wasn't sponsored by the company that made Oli Oli World Game, but <laughs> here I think I did a mistake not contacting them since there Me was neither. a. We, we like tried. It was a we yeah. Tried. We could we could get out something, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and also I will use the power of organizer to to ask the first question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So in the beginning, you showed that there's some kind of changes that happened with the main character. And we see definitely your pictures. And this is the most interesting part about the presentation. But what I'm also interested, how were your art director? Were there some pictures in between that were sent by the art director to you? How, your, how you were directed towards the end result, like how the communication was happening? Yeah, it was very simple. Uh... I think there, because there, there were not many steps behind those two images. Um, yeah, most of the time was just me drawing. So, like I can say, like that's like maybe I'm missing like two pages in between those two first uh, character development, but there was, I avoided them because they were also my drawings, and it's just like a gradient of feedback. Um, like um, the feedback. In that part was more like, you know, in general the whole project it been like, I give a lot of options and then they choose parts and they create like a monster from different things that they have drawn. Um, sometimes I get lucky and I draw something and it goes dear to the game. But yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Yeah. See people there. Hey, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to ask you about the, 
you showed the Valorant art uh, of the. You said it was an overlay sketch on a 3D blockout. Did you say like level oh, art? I know another paint of a 3D blockout. Like they gave me like an image of a of a very basic 3D, and then I have to overpaint it. All right. Do you know if they use that for texturing in the final game? Because it looks the same in the final game. So, like, do they use your art for the texture, or do they yeah. use it as concept? I know. I, yeah, I can't answer that because I was working through outsourcing. That they were very picky with the with the textures, but uh, but I'm not super sure about that. All right. Thank you, though. Uh, hi. Uh, how long does it about take to make that like really detailed illustration, like one of those very big, uh, like fully detailed? Yeah, in a mess. I should know. Um, I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe just if I have some designs that I done before, uh, just. Uh, Three, four, four days, maybe. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that for example, the uh, page of characters, the the NPCs that I show, the with the with the Barrock stuff, that the the cacti people and so on. I can make one page of that in maybe one or two days. Like that's the only thing that I have super clear about the timing. With the those bigger images, I'm not super sure because usually. Since I was making all of the artwork, the, from time to time I had some smaller tasks in between. So, so yeah, I would say around four days. Okay, thanks. More questions? Hi. Um, that seems to be a lot of work. Uh, did he develop any mental or technical ways to make it easier for you. For Oli Oli, you mean? Oli, yeah, Oli Oli, concept art. Okay. Can you repeat the question, sorry? <clears throat> because it seems to be a lots of work, lots of drawing, and lots of ideating, and uh, did you develop any mental helps or technical helps to make it easier for you and not to get blocked? Mm. Yeah, I think that just working with this, like, like I mentioned, to working with Liz Looney and Paul Abbott just made it super easy. Like, luckily, I'm happy to say that I didn't feel blocked. Like, I was always like having a lot of ideas because of the environment that I would have with the, with that people that they were very very open. Also, with John Ravens, the creative director, like the um, the way that the ideas worked there was very was very easy to to work on with 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 them. Um, also, I think that Lee's writing is great. Um, created like a very good mood for the for the world, and at the same time, like I don't know how, but I I didn't feel like stuck with with the with the ideas in the whole development. So sometimes it was um, a matter of containing myself, you know, just through more. Because for example, those pages of NPCs, like sometimes I drew like. 15 of them and just three, four made it to the game. So that was kind of a, of a waste. And also because they are super simple. So I was able to just try to think about the ideas and not worry about the, the technical aspects of it. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, another uh, question. So in the beginning you mentioned that, okay, I, I thought that concept art is this, is rendering and painting a lot of detailed pictures. And uh, did, uh, did your perception of the concept art change right now? What, what, what would be your description of the concept now? now? Yeah, I forgot to mention that I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't going to, to, to answer that question uh, <laughs> because like, yeah, like, I, I don't know. I still find it quite strange. I, I mean, at the end, concept art is just like pre-production for a project, and that's it. Like you can do, like you can do like the weirdest type of art that it's if it helps a project, that that's concept art. But uh, because of how usually concept art has been seen, I it wasn't sure. Like oh, maybe I have to go to animation because that's how like. 
because that's how the, the way I thought it worked. Um, so I don't know, at, at the end, I think it's just about ideas and that's it. And that's what I enjoy focusing on. Like I, like I, I don't like pe uh, things that are too repetitive. Like for example, the, yeah, like painting stuff and so on because it takes so long. Like I like to be able to just throw ideas as quickly as possible. So that would be my way of seeing concept art. Then it's, this is so specific that it's not something that I can work on a lot of companies. Like it's have to be very, uh, very specific for it. So yeah, I don't know if that answer at all, but yeah, it does. It does. So the main for me, like it's just about the idea is the main thing. Yeah. Hello. Uh, is your art um, influenced by your short background in engineering? Because you have very good uh, geometric and architectural style with very minimalistic line art. Thanks. Yeah, probably no. <laughs> 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 but fair, fair question. Uh, no, it's the, and the engineering was more about programming. It was like a new engineering in Spain. It was called video game development, but it was an official engineering, so it was a trap. When you enter there, is programming, um, uh, well, programming physics, math, and all of that. So no, uh, going there, I just realized that I I don't know how I studied there two years. Like on the second year, it was like, oh, what the hell I'm doing here? Like this is not for me. Like, I was struggling with everything, and I really didn't know that uh, what I was going to do. Uh, because I never trusted that drawing was a path for me, even though I've been drawing my whole life and I've never stopped, like I've been always drawing. But it, in my mind was not a space for thinking like, okay, maybe I can live by just uh, thinking about drawing. So yeah, sadly, I don't recall any relation from that time of my life with the type of work uh, that I do now. I was able to meet nice people, so that's uh, good enough. We we'll probably have time for one more question, and that's it for for German. Yep. If not, I can put a couple more trailers. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I had some kind of complicated, interesting question. Um, first of all, I think congratulations for being hired to do a video game with completely your style i think that's the dream and it's something that many of us would like to get to someday um but i i'm wondering because I, I work in an animation studio and when your style goes into this production um i just want to have a talk maybe about uh, I don't know, mental implications about your artwork being qualified, being measured, for example, many of the concepts you did, like really amazing line language and weight, and then many things get just cut, or even situations if maybe happen of hiring people who have to emulate your style and um, things like that. I, I'm just interested in knowing if you could talk a little bit about how it is to have your style in a production. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Like, I really appreciate it. You mean for the translation of my artwork to the final product with the team? You mean about that? that yeah, yeah, because it's, you have, as I said, very detailed style and the translation was quite not right there. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that at the end, the translation, that was like the, I think that the big, the big part of uh, Paul Abo, the art director, because luckily uh, I got the, I was able to, to work fully on the visual development and he gave me like the, the responsibility to just draw the way the way draws and then he was, but then uh, he was the one who was making sure that the whole thing was working uh, in that way, and that translation got perfectly into the into the game. Um, because at the end, there are some things in the game that I don't think are 
uh, related to the part that it was doing, like the, uh, f for example, we had like an amazing tech artist, Dicky, who was able to create the, the shader of the game, uh, which was looking amazing, basically. And uh, also, like the levels in the game is uh, like a very heavy weight on the team. Um, that was thanks to to the environment team that we that we had and the work of La La uh, Laura Dilloway, the lead environment artist that worked closely with Paul Abbott. Um, so because I had to do like a huge amount of work, I wasn't, uh, and we didn't have like a lot of time, I wasn't involved a lot into, um, into working on the feedback for the translation. It was, I have to say, it was very straightforward. Uh, the the translation of the literal concepts to the to the three D like it really worked very well. It just was just a matter of uh, fixing some things, but in general, I know it just just went smooth. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, just like a, a little correct, did you feel like you feel sorry about losing some of those details, you know, or you had to fix some of your art because, for example, the tech artists cannot reproduce that? Did you have any kind of a like, sadness moment or something? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, kind of like I'm I've been very like obsessive with those details, but I learned to let go because at the end you you can't, like I, I couldn't do that. And there are technical restrictions, which I didn't mention during the talk, but something great that we had in the pipeline was that Paul Owl was all the time telling me, te telling me to not worry about the technical issues. Like he was like, okay, you just design and then we will see how we do these things. And that's it. It was a nightmare for the, the people in charge of more technical aspects. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> but yeah, I completely forgot what I was saying. Um, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. About losing some detail on the game, um, but I don't know. It's uh, the thing. It, anyway, even though that we were losing some detail on some things, it. I think that still, if the if the main part of the design translates well into the game, like. I won't care about that. Like we 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 made some tests where I drew over some some screenshots on the game. We tried to add some more detail, but there is also this problem with how the gameplay is in the game. That sometimes you are moving super fast, so you are not able to see anything, and that's that's a shame because it's uh, there are a lot of work. There, are, there there is a lot of work on a lot of environments, but uh, it's uh, it's a matter of balance the, the the artwork with the with the game design which uh, at the end it's one of the most important things i guess oh, thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh, i guess that's it for 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 german's talk today and uh, thanks a lot it was amazing and uh, i think a lot of People here will purchase the game afterwards. It was a really great. We need a we need a commission. You need to that. yeah. Like we, we have a recording that you show that we yeah. should send them to the company. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, thanks you again for, for listening, and we'll be be uh, we'll start the next thing, which is a discussion on media responsibility in like ten minutes here, ten fifteen ish minutes. So please be back here, and uh, some cool people will join that discussion. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>